Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Emil Tompa. I'm the director of the Center for Research on Work Disability Policy, and I'm pleased to host today's session where we're going to be talking about the CSA Z1011, the Work Disability Management System Standard. This is our eighth webinar and, and, and one of a, a set of webinars that will continue through to May um, on um, the CSA Z1011. And today we're going to have conversations with on the employer's perspective. In terms of our, our session today, um, we'll be talking about um, the CSA Group Standard Development Process. Lina Lopez will be, be presenting on, on behalf of the CSA Group. I'm going to give a bit of background information on, on the issues related to employers' perspective and a high-level summary of the standard. And then we'll get into our fireside chat, chat with panelists, including questions and comments from attendees. Um, this is our group today, myself, Emil Tompa on the, on the uh, left side, Elena Lopez from the CSA group. Our panelists are David Brown, Corporate Medical Director at CIBC, Baden Naruzi Akia, Assistant Professor at the University of Toronto, Michael McDonald, Manager of Health Services at Jazz Aviation, and Joe Bayardo, Manager um, of Canada Life, uh, representing Ford of Canada. So we're going to start off with the standards development process. And Lena, do you want to take it from here? Absolutely. Good day, everyone. I'm Lena Lopez, a project manager at CSA Group. I'm going to discuss uh, briefly the standards development process and how the standard came to life. I can just ask next slide. So CSA Group is a non-government organization, and it consists of two divisions. If you could just hit next, you have the standards. Uh, division along with the standards development organization side. And that is where the standard was developed over on the non-for-profit side. Next. And next again, now the standards development on each committee, it consists of volunteers and the area of focus that CSA looks at, um, there are 12 main areas of focus. And the one that we are going to be speaking of is in occupational health and safety. Next. What's projected here on the screen is a list of CSA standards and then over on the left hand side, there's a list of the occupational health and safety management system standards. Here are a suite of standards and Z101011 falls into that suite and it also weaves into worker wellness, another area of focus that CSA has. Next. Here I'm going to describe and highlight the CSA, the cycle that each standard, regardless of the area of focus, the standard goes through. Uh, at the very beginning, either an individual or organization brings forward an idea to systemize a particular area of interest. So here it was work disability management. I can go to next. And here, once it, um, it goes over to Standards Council of Canada to ensure that the standard hasn't been produced already, uh, a technical committee group is uh, formed. And that's where they, well, I'm just looking at the screen here, uh, work on content development for approximately, oh, it can vary anywhere from five months over to um, under a year. And that's where the content is in, in a standard, excuse me, in a draft state. It will then go to public review. And that is where the public has an opportunity to provide their input, comment. And it comes back to the committee for review before it actually becomes a standard. I can actually uh, ask you to hit next and next again. Once it's disseminated, it is um, a living a living document for approximately five years in a maintenance stage. And that's where actually this document is right now. If I can ask you to hit next. So if you review the standard and you have any requests for interpretation, understanding anything that is written, you can always write back uh, to me and then it will go to the committee for uh, interpretation and for clarification. Next. Often a question we get, well, why does the government adopt standards? Uh, for several reasons, but what you have highlighted here are the standards have been developed as leading practices in a particular area, as well as with each standard, it undergoes a systematic review every five years. So it is updated 
looked at from environmental scan, what is happening in legislation, and also promotes uh, harmonization internationally. Next. So ways to get involved at CSA um, beyond participating on a technical committee, there is opportunity for individuals from the public to provide their input during the draft stage. So CSA has a site for public review. You can see all the standards, all the draft standards that are open for comments from the public. Also, CSA has an arm um, on research uh, that you can get involved in, as well as you're welcome to join the CSA communities where you can uh, ask a question or start to follow a certain community and then become involved in volunteering. So next. That is over to you, Emil. Okay, thank you, Lena. So um, uh, I'll just give you a bit of overview of the standard um, in the next few minutes. Um, so this um, technical committee was chaired by myself with vice chairs Amin Yazdani and David Brown, and the project managers were Lena Lopez and before her David Shanahan, who has since retired. And there was 26 voting members and several non-voting members that comprised the technical committee. Um, there was extensive effort to really ensure that there was a balanced representation from a broad variety of stakeholder groups and substantive ex expertise amongst them. So we had representation from employers, um, labor and unions, um, injured workers and disabled workers, health and safety professionals, return to work specialists, experts in work disability prevention, um, work disability insurance program providers, and academics and researchers like myself. Um, this is a list of the technical committee members. Um, it's quite a long list. There was quite a number of people from across Canada representing various stakeholder groups, as I've mentioned. I've highlighted in red the three members who are in the technical committee who are um, part of our panel, as well as David Brown, who is vice chair, whose name was mentioned on the previous slide. The four of them are part of our panel group today. Okay, so what's the problem? So trying to frame the, the reason for promoting this standard and developing it um, was that we heard a lot from various stakeholder groups that uh, the annual cost of work disability was quite high at the organizational level, at the systems level, and at the country level. And these are some estimates that have been taken from various sources um, between one to two trillion dollars worldwide when we think about the global burden of, of, of work disability. In Canada alone, there were some recent estimates undertaken by ESDC, Employment Social Development Canada, where they estimated the cost of exclusion um, at um, $337.7 billion or 17.6% of GDP. Now that's not exclusively the work component, that's across all social domains, so participation in various activities, but the productivity and output component alone was estimated at $62.2 billion or 3.2% of GDP. GDP. So quite a substantial burden for the Canadian society, for, for workers, for employers, for industry overall. So important to think about how can we do a better job of managing disability in the workplace. So that's the framing of the problem and need to address it in a kind of systemized, standardized, um, comprehensive way that, that can be easily adopted across different sectors, across different organizations, whether public or private, for profit or not for profit. You know, the chronic and episodic disabilities are particularly an issue these days with the aging of the labor force and poor mental health, another issue that is a predominant concern for many organizations. Our standard also um, includes um, recruit, hiring recruitment and onboarding of persons with disabilities. And we had noted that there was a high level of unemployment amongst people with disabilities, some talented individuals who struggle to find work because employers are not well equipped to accommodate people's diverse needs in order to hire the diversity of talent that's available in the labor market. In general, current practices for work disability prevention management is quite varied, piecemeal, often based on uh, not often not based on an organizational wide approach. So that's what we're promoting through this standard is an organizational wide approach to disability management that integrates with other parts of the management system. So the purpose of the standard is to provide a consensus-based framework for management of work disability at the organizational level and to address both physical and mental health needs of workers. So it's broadly scoped. It's not focusing on a particular type of disability. It includes both physical and mental health needs of workers um, who are part of your existing workforce and also at the front end when you're recruiting, hiring, and onboarding workers um, who may need accommodations. 
It includes consensus-based consensus guidance for recruitment, hiring, and onboarding, which is a key feature of this um, standard that uh, we, we were pleased to be able to include that in, in, the, in the best practice guidance. There's also some supporting materials um, that are provided with the standard if you'd purchase it. There's some annexes there that include some implementation tips. Now, traditionally, the approach used to address disability management with organization, within organizations has been to appoint a particular person, such as a work disability manager or someone in HR to address um, disability issues. So it's sometimes within the health human resources department or occupational health and safety department. And some organizations actually farm out some functions of disability management. So oftentimes it's a reactive approach that's taken to performance measurement using indicators such as absence days. So um, really looking after the fact, looking at the burden of absence days and seeing what can be done to address them rather than being proactive and preventing uh, absences whenever possible. So we're promoting a systems approach that is proactive, considers the roles and responsibilities across the organization. It's not delegated to just one person. Everybody in the organization plays a role when you take a management systems approach. We consider the inputs, process, outputs, and feedback. And evaluation improvement are done on a continual basis with, it, with a management system standard such as CZ1011. So what is a management system? Um, we get this question a lot because it may be new to some people. Um, it's a formalized framework of policies, processes, and procedures used by an organization to meet its objectives. And it's documented, tested, step-by-step -step methods really aimed at smooth functioning through standard practices. And audits play a really vital role for a management systems approach. And ideally, an organization will have frameworks of this sort in place to address all of its core organizational activities, including work disability management. So the systems approach to work disability management really ensures that there's clarity and consistency, and it's integrated with all the other organizational activities. Um, the standard um, promotes a proactive approach. It's meant to really address health needs of workers before they become disabling. So we sometimes use the vocabulary of work disability prevention because we're trying to prevent a health condition being disabling for a worker, if at all possible, by accommodating their needs before there may be an absence. So um, in this next slide, I'm just gonna go through a little bit more detail about the management systems a model. Um, you start off at the front end with policies which play a fundamental role in setting really clear directions for organizations to follow. Well, but then we wanna move to the management structures that need to be in place in order to deliver those policies. Um, we require a planning and system, systematic approach to implementing those policies. We really emphasize giving uh, given, we really emphasize the importance of measurement and performance evaluation against targets to see where there's improvement if need is needed. And you know, if we don't meet meet those targets, there may be room for improving to get at those targets. And then ultimately, we want to review and learn from experiences um, in, in order to be continuously thinking about how we can improve on the system. And then once we reach our targets, we go through that process on a periodic basis to see what other targets we can set for the next cycle of that continual improvement process. So some people um, call that continual improvement process plan, do, check, act, where there's four stages to that. The plan is about establishing Im improvement objectives. The do is implementing that plan. The check is monitoring and evaluating progress. And the acting is reviewing and taking action to make improvements wherever necessary. And then you continue the cycle from the first stage again once you reach your targets. So the um, CSA Z1011 is a broad framework to facilitate integration with all of the other organizational activities. It's really designed to be integratable with other standards if, if an organization has adopted them, such as the CSA Z45001, which is the Occupational Health and Safety Management System Standard, the CSA Z1003, which is the Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace Standard, or ISO 9, 9001 Quality Management System Standard. So these are all other standards that are out there for organizations to, 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 to um, purchase and, and um, integrate into their system. And the, our standard, the said 1000 Lab, is meant to dovetail with those standards. It takes a systematic organization-wide approach, and it really emphasizes joint management and integration with all the other activities and responsibilities in the organization. We've tried to use a common language and terminology wherever possible and draw on the vocabulary that's used in other standards so that we have a consistency across all of the standards. 
I should mention also that the standard is, is voluntary and it's, in, it's intended to serve as guidance that that's, provides some best practices and it's, it's assumed that minimum requirements of the law are met by the organization. So there's six guiding principles that are the foundation of this standard. It's an evidence-informed data-driven approach that's uh, strategic in nature to ensure sound policies and processes. Um, there's a focus on inclusion and accessibility to promote engagement and belonging of all the people in the organization. It really takes a worker-centered approach. It's meant to be supportive and contextualized where a case-by-case -case, um, approach is taken with addressing workers' health needs. It really promotes accommodation, early return to work wherever necessary, and it considers the essential duties of the worker's role within the organization when you think about accommodating workers' health needs. Um, it really focuses on joint responsibility between the organizational management, the workers and the workforce, and the worker representatives where applicable, such as labor or union representation. And legal compliance, as I mentioned, um, is, is a really important part of any organization's activity. So it, it's applicable with, from within the jurisdictions wherever the organization is based. It, it's assumed that they comply with the minimum requirements of the law in their jurisdiction. It's meant to be generalizable. So the standard is applicable to all organizations across Canada, whatever sector, whatever size they might be, whether it's for profit, not for profit, private, public se sector activities. So it's really broadly applicable. As I mentioned, it considers both the physical and mental health needs of workers, and it provides a comprehensive picture of the what, and then the implementation part, the how, um, is provided in some tips that are provided as an annex to the standard. Um, here I'm just describing in this slide um, some of the front end parts of the standard that describes the management and organizational roles and responsibilities. The, the first core chapter, chapter four, which I'll get into a little bit more details in a subsequent slide, really sets the stage for all of the actors within the workplace and describes their roles and responsibilities. So here I'm focusing on the management and organizational roles. So senior management um, commitment to, is senior management is committed to development, implementation, and maintenance of the disability management system standard. They play a key role in providing that commitment and, and, and supporting the development and implementation. They need to provide appropriate resources define and communicate the roles and responsibilities across the organization. They provide the required support wherever necessary. They facilitate worker participation and consultation. They're meant to provide leadership and accountability and establish a framework for regular reporting across the organization. The organization itself has responsibilities by encouraging collaboration, ensuring access to timely information, ensuring the supervisors have the right skills and abilities to address workers' health needs, and ensuring as well the right to privacy for workers and responsibility for ensuring inclusive and accessible workplaces for persons who have long-term health conditions that could be disabling if not appropriately accommodated. So in this um, slide, um, we uh, outline the, the core chapters. Um, so the core chapters are from chapter four, work disability management system, chapter five, planning, six, implementation, and seven, performance monitoring, evaluation, and continual improvement. And I also list here the annexes that, that are found in, in this standard. So um, chapter four um, is the, the foundation piece where it talks about the work disability management system standard. This section really emphasizes the involvement of all of the key stakeholders th that's essential for, for the standard to work well if it's implemented by an organization because everybody plays a role. Senior management, frontline managers, supervisors, internal subject matter experts, disability management specialists, healthcare professionals, workers, and their representatives, unions or labor representatives, all play a critical role. And in that first chapter, these roles are clearly detailed so that everybody knows their, their place in, within the system and know that they have a role within um, managing disability in the workplace. Chapter five gets into the planning phase. This section really emphasizes the need for organization to understand its strengths and identify areas where there, areas where there's room for improvement. So they want to develop a vision for the future, consider the organization's unique situation and capacity, and engage all key stakeholders in the process of, of trying to reach those targets that they're setting in the planning stage. In section six, the implementation, this section really emphasizes the importance of well thought out plan to achieve success really emphasizes a proactive approach in culture change. Subsections on accommodating workers with disabilities in recruitment, hiring and onboarding are also profiled. 
It notes the importance of promoting an inclusive and non-judgmental non environment towards workers with disabilities. And it also notes the importance of ensuring workers are not reluctant about reaching out for assistance by making them feel comfortable, um, that they know their confidentiality will be respected, that they can move, speak up to with their supervisors or managers when they need some support because their health is being compromised. And then section seven, um, performance monitoring, evaluation and continual improvement. This section really emphasized the importance of performance measurement. Um, it notes requirements of review and audit and continual improvement in recruitment, hiring and onboarding, as well as accommodation. And it really emphasizes that both qualitative and quantitative data are really important to the evaluation process. It also notes the importance of addressing deficiencies and identified on a timely basis. So now we will move to our um, panelists um, who are listed here, David Brown, Baden Naruzi Kia, Michael McDonald, and Joe Bayardo. And we'll start off with, uh, uh, sorry, if you all turn on your, your um, videos and audio, if you'll each give us an introduction, uh, a bit of background about who you are and um, um, your, you know, your background in terms of your role also with the technical committee as, and, and your organizational affiliations. Thank you. We'll start off with David. Uh, thank you, Emil. Uh, so David Brown, uh, Medical Director at CIBC for longer than I can remember, and uh, that takes me into pretty well every domain that uh, uh, where health touches the organization. And so uh, disability management and disability prevention are, are uh, key parts of that, uh, although far from being the whole, uh, the whole role. I don't know whether you want to go ahead, Bidin, and, and uh, describe yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, David. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, I guess, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Betty Nozakia. I'm an occupational therapist. I've uh, been in clinical practice now probably 14, 15, 14 years, hard to believe it. And I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. Delighted to be here with you. Michael? Hi there. Um... My name is Michael McDonald, and I'm uh, the manager of the Health Services Department for Jazz Aviation. I'm also a doctorate student with Queen's University studying re uh, rehabilitation and health leadership. And um, I've been on the uh, committee supporting as a person with a disability, but also as an employer representative uh, to help shape the, uh, the standard. And it's been an honor to be invited today. Thank you. Joe? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joe Bayardo. I'm the uh, manager and uh, paralegal with uh, Canada Life at Port of Canada. Um, I've been with the uh, with Canada Life at Port of Canada for the past 20 years. Have a team of uh, individuals who uh, deal specifically in disability management and uh, sickness and accident benefits. I also represent Ford at all WSIB uh, hearings and tribunals. Um, I was part of this uh, CSA uh, committee and it was an honor to be a part of it, uh, uh, of course, uh, as the management side representing the Canadian Vehicle Manufacturing Association, uh, which includes our friends at uh, uh, General Motors and Chrysler also. So we work together on uh, health and safety and uh, workers' compensation issues together, uh, particularly on the CSA I was honored uh, also to chair one of the uh, committees, I believe it was the implementation committee um, and involved with uh, all of the other aspects of the, uh, of the standard. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and Lena, do you wanna um, um, join us as well to monitor the chat and question and answers that come forward? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so, so um, in this next slide here, I have some questions that I'm gonna pose to the panelists. Um, for, for people in the audience, you can also send in your questions through the chat function or through the questions and answer function. And, and Nina will be monitoring those and we'll try to get them into the conversation whenever we can. And so for my first question that I'm posing to the panelists, um, I wanna focus on large organizations to start off with. This, as I mentioned, the standard is designed for both large, small, medium-sized organizations. It's not really sector specific or size specific, but for large organizations, I'm wondering, what are the key worker health challenges that large organizations are confronting today? We hear a lot about mental health being a big issue. And how can the standard help organizations address these challenges? And for organizations, particularly that are already 
in, well invested into disability management, what's in it for them when to, to think about adopting this standard? What value added can that bring to the organization? And so I'm going to start off with David and see um, what he has to say about these issues. As you, David, you work with a large organization, so very appropriate for you to speak to this issue. Uh, it, it's a very timely uh, time uh, for this discussion. So uh, um, I think for CIBC, mental health issues are always high on our agenda of things that we'd like to do, manage better, do better, and uh, take a very strong preventative role in. And of course, we have to mention the elephant in the room here, which is, of course, this wretched virus that's running around the place. And I, and I think the disruption that that uh, virus has, uh, has caused um, has given us a real opportunity in the uh, sort of the work disability prevention side of things, uh, not so much on the virus, or that's a whole uh, piece on its own, uh, more on a health and safety note, but um, really I think people's resilience here is, uh, is a, a thing that we really need to protect and enhance. And so um, when we look at uh, uh, what's going on at CIBC in terms of what are the, the big issues we're facing, clearly, the nature of work has changed. The two thirds of our workforce uh, sort of essentially working remotely now. Uh, and that was done essentially overnight. And you can just imagine the ripple effect that that's had, uh, uh, never mind ergonomics, never mind uh, uh, the uh, electronics required by that. But in terms of being a manager, uh, what that means, um, and uh, all of the new uh, things like work eating into time uh, that you would normally spend eating or with your family or uh, and so a whole set of new norms uh, had to be developed really quite quickly in the whole notion of preserving uh, resilience so um, really the disability standard uh, from a prevention perspective gave us some very clear uh, ideas of we need to know what's going on so uh, believe it or not we've uh, um, uh, surveyed the organization on where they are in resilience. We, we've highlighted the areas where we need to, uh, um, to, to do work to support that. And so we have also got the ability to be able to track that. So resilience, pr protection of employees, huge part of the work disability prevention uh, thing. In terms of the, the virus itself and what that's done on our day-to-day -day, um, uh, piece is, um, very simply, as you well know from listening to me ad nauseum, probably on the, uh, the demedicalized approach that CIBC has, where we focus more on the person, their circumstances, their whatever, and we don't chase the medical information or, you know, the way some people do. We focus in on what the person's abilities are and try to accommodate them. So all of a sudden, we've got the virus. Um, we now uh, uh, had to change on in, on in the moment and, and pay attention to what was making people sick in the terms of the virus. And so we have a whole team that's out there uh, looking for contacts, this, that, and the other. So having the standard and the whole outline of uh, privacy requirements and providing a consistent approach while we deal with this hopefully temporary glitch in our, in our world, uh, the standard has provided a, a lot of uh, very useful information. And finally, you know, so we've been at the disability management business for a while uh, in the broadest sense. And so the standard has given us comfort. Uh, and I can't emphasize this enough to people that um, it, it sets it out. There's a sort of consensus out there. This is a good way of doing things. Um, gave us a chance to reflect uh, and also to review what we're doing and sort of look for uh, what, what, what gaps might, might we have out there and what, how might we uh, better uh, uh, manage things on a, on a uh, standards basis. So um, that's helped us with ease of management, uh, looking at some of uh, our outsourced uh, activities, whether that's some aspects of disability management uh, or benefits and things like that, making sure that we align those to the, the, the disability, disability prevention needs. And so um, really the uh, it, it standard gave us a really nice framework uh, with which to review things. I'm gonna stop there to let others uh, get their 10 cents worth in. Does anybody wanna jump in, Michael? Yeah, um, when, I, when I think about the questions, I, I kind of find that for jazz, our, our situation is a lot different and very much the same as what uh, 
Davich's shared, uh, you know, with the key worker challenge for us right now is just the idea of um, short and long-term stability in the face of the pandemic, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of questions, and a lot of fear of the unknown. And so what I, I think comes from the standard for us is the fact that it gives some structure to um, acknowledging the fear without medicalizing it and without, um, you know, uh, creating further panic and fear. And what we do is we, we use it to structure the conversations with our employees and say, okay, which bucket do you need to draw from given your circumstances? So, you know, are you experiencing personal health issues that, you know, um, provide you with some limitations or are you experiencing circumstantial issues that cause you to have limitations? And then we use that to kind of structure our conversations and it's very useful and it, it's very reassuring. And our employees, for the most part, I, I feel like they're, feeling somewhat supported and there is it's a clear sense of um a pathway that is reassuring right because in the face of the pandemic we don't know what's going on and when we know that we have a clear understanding of which benefit they should access and which programs are available to support them while they need to step away from work for personal reasons or for family reasons um and the the, the structure of the the standard really helps with that Thank you, Michael. Um, Joe, do you have anything to add? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, again, it, the, um, this issue, particularly what are the key worker health challenges in larger, large organizations is, uh, um, is as uh, David has indicated, um, very timely in terms of, particularly with the pandemic and the example we have um, on the, the question here is, question is mental health uh, issues. Uh, certainly from um, my experience and uh, our team's experience, um, mental health has been one of those issues that has been growing um, within the works, workplace and outside of the workplace. Whereas 10, 20 years ago, um, it might have fell under the category of stress or uh, general stress and uh, and anxieties. And uh, I, I think large organizations are finding that uh, the mental health issues, particularly on the number of claims and, uh, and the costs involved, uh, um, have been increasing. Um, and usually when we think of disability management, we, we often think of the physical um, accommodation uh, of, of individuals or employees or workers. Um, but the, the mental health uh, issue has been one that's been increasingly uh, increasing over the, uh, I would say the past decade, uh, and now uh, has been heightened, of course, uh, with the pandemic. So it, it adds uh, uh, an additional di uh, dimension because once, we are, once you're dealing with the physical aspect, uh, um, you, you think about you know, the physical demands of the job and you, try to accommodate with the functional abilities of the individual um, and, uh, and, and you try to match those two. Mental health though is one of those issues that involve a whole gamut of, uh, of issues both inside and outside the workplace. And it, it uh, poses the question to larger employers, um, how do we make this environment uh, a welcoming environment, uh, just like schools and uh, uh, school boards that are dealing with that issue also, um, and bullying and all that stuff. That that all comes into play in the workplace, uh, but then there's all these societal issues uh, that that come into play also. So I, I I just wanted to to share that 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 is an increasing issue both with large organizations and. Um, and I, I would think uh, with small organizations. And this standard, I, I think, uh, has helped me in particular as a, as a, a member sort of get out of that uh, mindset that everything is work-related or not work-related. Uh, and that, uh, as David said, uh, investing in and focusing uh, on people's abil abilities um, rather than the technical aspect of where the accident occurred and and uh, how it happened and, and so on, who's responsible and, and so on. So, mm -hmm. 
thank you for that, Joe. I, I like that you emphasize the point that um, the standard really focuses on a person's health needs, regardless of whether it's work related or, or the cause co arises from some other source. And I think it really deals every, with everybody on a level playing field. If somebody has a health need that needs, requires attention, you deal with it regardless of if it's a worker's compensation claim, a private disability insurance claim, or just a, a general sickness absence. So that's a really good point. Um, Baden, do you wanna get the last word in on this question? Sure, um, I, uh, only to, mm, I'm very excited to hear that, you know, we're moving away um, from the practice of just looking at it through a biomedical lens, um, which has been widely accepted pretty much as throughout many of the institutions that still fund and uh, deal with um, work disability. But I think um, both as a, as a clinician and as a researcher, my approach has always been on the preventative side and also on a very much on a patient centric or client centered approach where we essentially utilize the strengths of the individual and work around that. That's something that I've done in uh, clinical practice for a very long time. And it's pretty much, pretty much central to occupational therapy. So it's very um, exciting to hear that. So I'll just leave it on that point because it's, uh, it's very heartwarming. Uh, thank you, Vin. Okay, so let's move on to the next question then. So looking at the other end of the spectrum, small and medium-sized businesses, you know, they don't have obviously as many resources as larger organizations do. So they may um, also be confronted with different kinds of challenges as a result of their situation. So what are some of the key challenges that small and medium-sized businesses might confront if considering adopting the standard, and yeah, are, are there before we jump into that, um, there are there are many layers to work to the management system. Where should they start? Obviously, they might be at a different place in larger organizations that have been doing this for a while. And then, are there sectoral issues that are particularly challenging? You know, such as the high turnover in the hospitality sector. Ben, did you want to start off on this sure. question? Yeah, I guess you can sense my enthusiasm on <laughs> getting exactly. going on this. But I uh, know uh, absolutely. I think. You know, we can't have this discussion without, you know, framing it within the current once in a generational pandemic that has pretty much swept across the uh, small and medium sized enterprise landscape uh, in Canada and beyond. So I think that has to be framed within that discussion. You know, prior to this, if you um, when I worked with small and medium sized enterprises, particularly in parts of the, the province of Ontario, where they may not have necessarily had the same access as you would have to care and different types of services that you would in large urban centers, the challenges were very much pronounced around um, having someone that is off work and then being able to accommodate them but not having the resources. So I think the standard can um, provide that gap and act as a liaison to say, well, this is perhaps one document, a set of guidelines that you can look at and subscribe to if this is something that is of interest to you to work collaboratively in a model that is client-centered, or if I can use the term worker-centric in this context, and allows for a collaborative partnership to begin. So it's no longer good enough for us to say that the onus is on the individual worker to navigate this um, complexity that many of us are, have been uh, working in for many years and know that it's difficult. Even every year, every time I learn something new about the system. So it is very involved. So we the expectation should be this a joint collaborative partnership. And for small, medium-sized enterprises, in addition to the lack of resources that they have, this idea of this undue hardship that they experience because of the uh, limitations and resources on top of what's going on with the pandemic, many of them are just trying to stay afloat financially. And um, they're the backbone of the Canadian economy. And we have to be very mindful of that. Um, where we go from here, um, it waits to be seen. I think that the standard is um, available at a very important time for small and medium-sized enterprises to kind of dive into it and start to understand what it is that it's positioning on. What's the framework that it starts off with? It's going to tell you that you need many stakeholders at the table. It's going to tell you that the um, approach you should be taking is one that considers the individual's um, medical or health status, the individual's personal supports, the individual's relationships in the workplace, and other stakeholders that they're involved with, maybe allies from their associations or their unions that are working in partnership and in unison to bring the individual either back to work or sustain them in the workplace or whatever the situation may be. And I'll also add that um, for small and medium-sized enterprises to consider 
that you really have to be looking at it through a preventative lens. I think if, uh, one thing that I've learned through many years of clinical practice is that oftentimes I come into a situation where I'm dealing with an injured worker on the reactionary side. And that is that they've already been injured, whether it's a physical injury or a mental health injury, you're going to see someone that you're essentially bringing back after the uh, injury or the illness has occurred. Why not look at this through the approach of using the standard through prevention and ensuring that safe workplaces are subscribed to by all SMEs and that we have an environment where they can all thrive and be successful. Um, I think I'll stop right there and invite the other panelists to chime in as well. Thank you. Um, David, I think you're muted. Is that better? Yep, great, thank you. I'll just jump in very quickly because I think one of the things that uh, small and business, small and medium-sized businesses uh, um, get confused. They say, well, where do I start with all of this? Mm -hmm. And um, and I think a really good resource, I'm going to give you three really good resources. If you have a union, that's a good place because uh, they often have uh, a lot of expertise uh, and that might seem like a strange place for many organizations to consider, consider starting, but they have a lot of expertise. The other place to look is your um, benefits carrier. Some of the large insurance companies um, have uh, teams of people who can help you sort through this uh, uh, to, to, uh, to a certain degree as well. And the other thing that many small companies sign up for uh, is employee assistance programs. And we sort of think of those as counseling. And that's where it begins and ends. And I would say to you that those organizations also have a vested interest in, in, in uh, disability prevention and whatnot. So a lack of expertise is sometimes or, uh, seen as a huge barrier to small and medium companies. And so I would just say there are other places you can look. You don't have to always uh, generate it from within. Mm -hmm. Thank you, David. George, you want to add anything there? Yes, definitely. I, I think uh, in in keeping with the uh, previous question, the, the uh, third part in terms of uh, investing in disability management for large large organizations, uh, small and medium sized businesses don't necessarily have the resources uh, to invest uh, massively, like Ford does uh, in with the Canada Life Team at the inside uh, their plants. Um, my team of people are, are probably many students from uh, uh, Baden's uh, uh, classes, uh, uh, hired uh, kinesiologists or ergon ergonomic specialists and people who can have the technical knowledge to, um, to understand and, and, and get people back to work safely. Um, but it, small and medium-sized businesses do not necessarily have that, uh, those resources. And usually it's the one person um, administering the WSIB and the sickness and accident benefits and and return to work uh, uh, services uh, that that's doing all of that and my my uh, thinking in in terms of the small and medium sized businesses is that when you're hiring that person look to that person for those uh, for those skills not necessarily on being able to. Um, appeal that claim, uh, or making sure that uh, uh, that uh, you know the, the person uh, gets back to work at, at all costs. Uh, but invest in in the person that uh, that is uh, um, a more empathetic, uh, more as someone who who understands um, what it is to be uh, disabled and uh, and or and having the ability to identify workers' abilities and, and, and uh, accommodate them accordingly. So I, I think that, I think as, as Baden said, the movement away from the adversarial process to uh, administrative disability management to the actual um, physical disability management uh, uh, process. And this is where the standard comes in uh, and, and is very helpful in that way. And, um, identifying uh, issues that, that arise that, that can better um, help you in accommodating uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Joe. I, I like the emphasis on moving away from that medical model and really looking at the person-centered approach. Michael, did you want to add anything there? 
Yeah, actually, I, I do. Uh, I, I'm, I've been inspired by what Baden and Dave and uh, Joe have been saying. And one of the things that I kind of want to make sure that small and, small and medium sized businesses think about is, you know, the idea of prevention isn't just about um, making sure that the person doesn't get um, injured in the first place. Prevention is also avoiding the barriers that inhibit hiring a person with a disability in the front end and making sure that you create an accessible workplace um, that allows the maximum number of people to contribute to your agenda as much as possible. So when you have a task in mind, you want to design that task in such a way that almost anybody can do it and it gives them a chance to meaningfully contribute to the agenda that you've set as the employer. And in, in that, building on what Joe was saying, when you're hiring your, your case management professionals, you don't want to focus in on the technical skills around, you know, writing an effective appeal letter or being able to analytically uncover those opportunities to save the employer some money. What you want to do is create an opportunity and create a workspace where everybody feels trusted and secured and valued. And that requires compassion and empathy. But you can create that uh, space where employers are, employees are feeling secure in their job. And then when they feel they're secure in their job, they're able to do well. And when they do well, you do well as an employer, right? So that productivity is going to translate into profitability for you at some stage. Um, and you really do need to keep an open mind and allow yourself to be pleasantly surprised by people's motivations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I really like the way you're framing it around the win-win because really if you do accommodation while people's needs over the time they're with the organization, it, it's a boon for the, the organization in terms of productivity enhancement. It's a boon for the worker being more fully engaged and, and connected to the workplace. So it really is a win-win if you do it well. Nina, do we have any questions from the audience that you want to insert at this stage? Yeah, we do. Um, there's one question, it's two parts. So first question reads, question deals with case managers who overlook review and assist in the disability management process. Do case managers require some kind of certification or expertise? Who exactly are case managers? That's the first part. And the second part's regarding retraining. Mm -hmm. I'll ask that question afterwards. Okay. So case Before. management. <laughs> so I, I, I can offer some commentary on the, the case management thing. There's a lot of great uh, programs out there that um, case managers and developing case managers might want to look at, but it's not a critical feature to, to be certified um, per se, but it, it's valuable, right? So I got into the industry myself as a person with a disability and I did some case management for some insurance companies and then for um, workers' compensation board. Um, I'm presently a teaching assistant in one of the disability management programs at a local university here in Halifax. And uh, that program does a really good job of preparing students and every region has some great programs. And ultimately the, the expertise that I look for when I'm hiring case managers into my team is I need somebody to understand the multidisciplinary nature of the work. Um, and that's the really cool thing about this. The standard is that it really spells it out without saying you must, thou shalt have X designation. Instead, it spells out that, you know, these are the things you need to understand in order to be effective. It's, you know, there's a little bit of social sciences in there. There's a little bit of law in there. There's a little bit of medical sciences in there. There's a little bit of social work. Um, and there's a whole lot of compassion and understanding and empathy that comes into that. So um, when you're a hiring manager and a client, uh, you, what you want to focus on is having somebody who has that capacity to understand all the nuances of the process and provide that support in a meaningfully compassionate way. Mm -hmm. And if you can take a course to help you with that, great. Um, but sometimes it comes with life experience. Thank you, Michael. Anybody Thank want you. to add something, Joe? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, this is definitely the area that I'm uh, very much involved in. Um, the case managers that I hire, um, certainly, uh, again, because of the, the company that I'm involved with, I have the, uh, the luxury of hiring uh, people with uh, specific skills in kinesiology and ergonomics and, and so on. Um, but uh, I understand, particularly for the small and medium-sized businesses, 
uh, as I said before, it's usually the same person. And uh, I agree entirely what my, Michael was saying in that uh, certification is helpful. But if you find someone with all of those uh, aspects um, in the legal side, understanding the, uh, the, the disability management process and uh, accommodation um, and someone with empathy, it, it, it is very helpful. Uh, fortunately, I, I was involved years ago in the establishment of the uh, original disability man management program at Mohawk College through NIDMAR, who was uh, also one of our, one of our uh, participants uh, in this CSA uh, from NID NIDMAR, National Institute of Disability Management and Research. Uh, and certainly getting that certification, um, that education uh, under your belt, understanding the disability management process and, uh, and in particular, I'm sure they'll incorporate uh, this CSA standard in, in that education process um, it is certainly beneficial. But uh, as Michael said, uh, I think the empathy part, uh, understanding and, and having those um, interpersonal collaborative skills uh, to work with in a unionized environment uh, and uh, and you know difficult individuals uh, you know uh, sometimes uh, in discipline management you have to have someone who who is well rounded. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you have to have good people skills. The empathy I like that you know people oriented and and have the diversity of life skills that you've gained over time you know or with regards to where you come from. Um, David, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, no, you, I think you nailed it there, uh, Emil. I, I, our number one priority is good communication skills. Two is empathy, uh, which you've uh, uh, alluded to. The other thing, uh, so uh, the other thing is to be able to work in a team framework mm -hmm. um, and sort of recognize the multi-dimensional approach that's required. And when I think of our team at the bank, I. I don't know that we actually have a nurse. I know we have a psychologist. Uh, we have a couple of um, uh, ergonomists, um, but most um, what they bring to the table are their communication skills and their empathy and organizational skills, because that's what you need uh, to, if you're, we're talking specifically case disability management, uh, whether, you, whether you're certified or not, uh, to me, it doesn't really matter. It's those those the other things are the key part for me. Thank you. Um, Nina, what's the other part of that question, if you want to throw it in at this point? Yeah. The second question has to do with retraining. In particular, for an, in, for an employee who was injured on the job, how would you, as an employer, work to either retrain them or provide a different type of work? In sum, how has retraining changed due to COVID-19? Okay. I'm going to give this one to Baden to start off, if you don't mind, Baden. Sure. I mean, you know, I think within the, the context, I was going to add to the previous point as well, but I'll put them together. Um, I think that um, from a retraining perspective, so much of the work that was done perhaps by people uh, in person has now navigated to online. So there's that component of um, what can be done remotely, what can be done in person, what does retraining look like Um within the context of the current pandemic and as we move forward, what will long COVID have in terms of the impact of onboarding, um, retraining and so forth. So I think these are the types of questions that I would ask. Um, and it, if I can turn this to um, the aspect of the case managers who would be an integral part of the retraining process, it would be to turn to the standard and look at some of the annexes. We wrote an annex um, about the role of the health professional and the healthcare worker that can in many ways act as your um, ally or confidant uh, with the case manager in supporting that individual's retraining or sustaining them in the workplace. Meaning that uh, certainly the case manager has all the attributes that um, we heard from the other speakers. But in addition to that, they can rely on the expertise of people like um, David Brown and others um, in, in different disciplines that are regulated because they will bring um, with them the uh, knowledge that we talked about, the, the scientific component, but there's also an art 
piece to it. And I think as regulated health professionals, they can bring that to the table in terms of the confidentiality, the accountability that you may not always get with case managers if they're not from uh, a regulated aspect. So I want to bring that to the discussion because I think it's important. It's important because the other tangible skills can be learned and applied to um, through additional training, um, such as the NIDMAR courses or elsewhere. And it is really a confluence of human resources, um, of the soft skills, if I can call them that, but in addition to having some content knowledge, but really having someone that has that background can be very beneficial being the healthcare side because you can have all of that expertise in addition to the skills of the case manager. And if the case manager can liaise with those healthcare professionals as we've outlined in that annex, I think it will lead to a very um, strong approach, particularly when it comes to retraining within the context of uh, COVID-19 as well. Thank you, Ben. Anybody else want to speak to the issue of retraining? I, uh, I'll pipe in. Sorry, Joe. Um, <laughs> so what I was going to say is uh, I, I've had the good fortune of being part of this type of dialogue a couple of times at Jazz Aviation. And essentially, you know, one of the things that really is critical is uh, considering what the, the individual wants and what are they excited about. Um, you know, there, there are different roles that are naturally gravitating to expanding their skill set and other roles are very specialized and very interested in sticking within the, the pattern that they've created for themselves in their career. So it really, for me, the, the retraining question comes back to the individual and their interests mm -hmm. and what are they, um, it, you know, uh, motivated to pursue. Uh, for example, uh, in our workplace, we have flight attendants that are really socially engaged and really enjoy interacting with other people. And then we have aircraft mechanics who really like um, focusing in on the hands-on tasks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes the, the mechanics are not as interested in being retrained for desk work. So that's not something that they would be motivated to pursue. Mm -hmm. Whereas the flight attendants, when they get an opportunity, we had a really great example where one of our long-term flight attendants acquired a very substantial injury during some turbulence on an aircraft. And uh, she was unable to return to her job as a flight attendant, but she was very, very motivated to stay with the company. And she ended up becoming part of our recruitment team. And because she knew the work as a flight attendant very, very well, she was able to help select and guide the careers of future flight attendants coming into jazz. Um, and so that, that was an exciting thing to be part of. Um, but again, like I said, it really, for me, the retraining question really starts with what does the worker want? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joe, you were going to mention something as well. Yes. Uh, again, with regards to uh, retraining, um, that is part of the disability management process, uh, if you will, in terms of accommodating uh, individuals. And retraining is at the, I would say, at the tail end of of the, the accommodation or disability management process, whereas you would originally try to uh, get someone back to their uh, original job. In the automotive industry, um, retraining might be uh, something that if you can't get that person back to its, uh, his or her original job, then you might look at um, other aspects of the job if it, it perhaps doesn't involve above the shoulder work, um, you know, move uh, the person down the line at another another function where it doesn't involve uh, above the shoulder work and, and so on. Th that's a, a very simple aspect of it. But again, you're looking at this as a um, as a spectrum uh, of um, uh, of accommodation uh, of that individual and retraining uh, for the most part in the past has been well, we can't find anything here at, at our company for you. You'll have to, particularly in workers' comp cases, um, seek retraining through WSIB. Uh, and so uh, out the door they go and benefits continue forever. Um, and I think larger companies have come to terms with that and saying, well, we've invested in this individual. He's been with us for 20 years. Um, so we can retrain them and keep them within our company in another aspect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David, did you want to say something as well? I, I, I did, because I wanted to pick up on Michael's uh, story, which actually I thought was quite inspirational because what it, it did for me was it, it emphasizes the shift that we need to make away from trying to fix something 
as opposed to taking the mindset of inclusion. Mm -hmm. And so here was an individual who something bad happened to, who had a lot of knowledge and, and uh, Jazz, a uh, rare candidate, was able to actually take the mindset and say, look, we've got somebody here with a wealth of information. Um, how can we take this person's skill set and, and, uh, and apply it? And, uh, and so it moved away from, quote, retraining uh, to a, a much more uh, um, forward-looking uh, inclusion approach. And, and I'd like to really emphasize that part of the standard as being very, very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michael's story really brought that to the fore. Yeah. Thank you for that, David. Yeah, the emphasis on person-centered, you know, case-by-case -case approach is really emphasized throughout the standard, really thinking about the interests and skill sets of the worker and, and, and working with that worker in, in a collaborative way to find the best solutions to meet their needs and the organization's needs. Unfortunately, we're out of time and there's lots of other great questions I see coming up on, on the chat function and the question and answer, but we won't be able to tend to them today, unfortunately. Maybe at the next session, well, you'll be able to get your word in from the audience. Um, so I just want to thank the speakers um, um, uh, to participating on this panelist, to Lena, who from the CSA group, who gave us an overview of the standards development process. And to all the audience who have participated in this session and all your great questions, we're really love, pleased to have you uh, here. And we have a number of other sessions coming up going forward. So I have a list here on this slide here on February 22nd. There's another one that looks at the, con the role of healthcare and disability management service provider. That is being presented by CIS. Canadian Institute for Safety, Wellness, and Performance. Okay, great. At Conestoga College. <laughs> at Conestoga College. And then the March 8th one is again with us, the Center for Research on World Disability Policy, where we'll continue the conversation from the insurance provider's perspective. Um, um, March 22nd, um, Conestoga College again looks at the labor perspective. On the end of April, we'll have um, the role of healthcare and disability management services again. And then May 10th will be our last one we're looking at the labor's perspective. So please do join us for these webinars if you have the opportunity to do so. Thank you very much for joining us and have a great day and a great week. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.